This section is referred to as the data forwarding scenario. And basically, we pull together the function of all the protocols that have been introduced and apply them as part of the common TCP IP data forwarding process. The TCP IP protocol suite operates as a collection of rules in order to support the end-to-end -end forwarding of data, together with the lower layer protocols, such as those defined in the IEEE 802 standards. The knowledge of the lifecycle of data forwarding enables a deeper understanding of the IP network behavior for effective analysis of network operation and troubleshooting of network faults. The entire encapsulation and decapsulation process therefore represents a fundamental part of all TCP IP knowledge. So upon completion of this section, it is generally expected that trainees will be able to explain the process steps for data encapsulation and decapsulation, as well as troubleshoot basic data forwarding issues. We begin here by setting the scene of a typical network architecture that involves locally established end stations, together with an IP gateway, by which other networks can be reached. This scenario will demonstrate how data is encapsulated and transmitted between the source and intended destination, taking into account many of the aspects that have been introduced within this unit, as well as represent additional aspects that are made apparent through this scenario. Prior to the encapsulation or forwarding of data, it is necessary that the sender be aware of a path to the intended destination. Host A represents the sender, to which it is intended that data be forwarded to server A via RTA. We see here that an IP routing table exists within Host A that lists all of the known networks, which currently comprises of only the network to which it is connected. In the table, however, the network 0.0.0.0 is stated and refers to any network along with the path by which the data should be forwarded, which in this case specifies the gateway of RTA. Once it is discovered that traffic intended for server A is to be forwarded to the IP gateway of RTA with the destination of 10.1.1.254, Host A is expected to determine whether a physical path exists over which traffic can be forwarded in order to physically reach RTA. It does this by inspecting the ARP cache for an entry. In this example, we can see that the ARP cache for host A contains two IP addresses that have been resolved to MAC addresses. The first is for RTA, the second for host B. In this case, host A is aware of the destination MAC address of RTA and so the encapsulation process can be performed. If, however, host A did not have an entry in the ARP cache, the ARP process would need to be performed as was covered in the ARP section of this unit. Encapsulation begins with the upper layers in which any translation of data formats and any session-based operations that involve encapsulation are performed. We tend to find that the adding of instructions often begins with the transport layer and the encapsulation through either TCP or UDP is performed. In this example, we can see the TCP header is added to the data that is to be transmitted. There may be events, however, where no data is carried, such as in the case of the TCP three-way handshake. The resulting encapsulation leaves us with a TCP segment that awaits further encapsulation at the network layer. The IP header is added to the segment to form a packet along with the population of the relevant fields, including the source and destination IP addresses. Since the protocol prior to IP is TCP, the protocol field will be populated with the hexadecimal value 06. The total size of the packet in this form is expected to be no larger than 1500 bytes in size. Since the upper layer protocol is IP, the Ethernet 2 frame type is applied as part of the Ethernet encapsulation process. We would find that the frame header consists of the source MAC address of host A and the destination MAC address of the next hop which in this case happens to be the MAC address of the gateway, RTA. The type field will again point to IP since this is the upper layer protocol and so will be populated with the hexadecimal value of 0800. The frame header and trailer represent a total size of 18 bytes, giving a frame size of up to 1518 bytes at this point. Prior to the forwarding of the frame, it is necessary for the sender, which in this case is host A, to verify that the transmission medium is clear of any data, specifically if the medium represents a shared medium in order to avoid any collisions. The actual forwarding of a frame onto the physical medium is preceded by what is known as the preamble and start of frame delimiter that represents in total a 64-bit string of interleaving 1 and 0 bit values. This gives the receiving interface enough time to react to the sudden arrival of a frame. 
The final two bits of the startup frame delimiter are set to 1 and indicates that the bits that follow represent the start of the actual frame. Transmission of the frame by host A will see its propagation across the local network in a shared collision domain, resulting in the frame also being received by host B. Host B, however, will determine that the destination MAC address does not match its own and will discard the received frame. The gateway will also receive a copy of this frame and will start the same process. We see here an example of the frame structure as it is received, for which the integrity of the frame will be initially checked to ensure that the frame has not suffered any complications during transit. If all is well, the destination MAC address is checked against the MAC address of the interface, which in this case is interface gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 0. Once confirmed that the destination MAC address and the interface MAC address are the same, the frame header is discarded and the packet is forwarded to the protocol listed in the frame type field, which happens to be the internet protocol or IP. IP will receive the packet at the network layer and will need again to verify the integrity of the packet header. If all is OK, the IP address will be checked. The receiving gateway must determine whether the received packet's destination IP address and the IP address of the gateway match. If the IP address matches the address of the gateway, the gateway will proceed to send the packet to the next protocol, such as in the case of ICMP. If the packet's destination IP address and the IP address of the interfaces of the gateway do not match, the gateway must determine the next course of action. This is done by consulting the IP routing table in the gateway to identify whether the path to the intended destination is known by the gateway. If the path is not known, the gateway will discard the packet and return an ICMP packet back to host A. If the path is known, as shown in the example by the 172.16.10.0 entry via interface gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 1, the gateway will proceed to encapsulate the IP packet in a new frame header, but not before it has verified that the physical path is known. If the physical path is not known, the gateway must employ ARP to determine the new path. The new frame header will use the MAC address of the gigabit ethernet 0 slash 0 slash 1 interface as the source MAC address and the next hop will be the destination MAC address in the frame header. Following encapsulation of the packet, the frame forwarding process is undertaken to propagate the frame over the remaining path to the intended destination. If the segment is considered to be shared, the frame transmitted will be received by all end stations on the segment, which includes server B. Server B, however, is able to validate that the frame is not intended for this destination, since the destination MAC address of the frame and the MAC address of the server do not match, and so this copy of the frame will be discarded. The frame will also be received by server A, which again checks the integrity of the frame and compares the frame's destination MAC address to its own, and discovers that the frame has reached its intended target. The frame header and trailer are discarded as part of the decapsulation process and delivered to the internet protocol as a result of the 0800 hexadecimal value found in the type field of the frame header. The packet is received by the internet protocol that will analyze the contents of the IP header and determine the course of action to be taken. The integrity of the IP header is firstly checked along with the intended destination IP address. If the destination IP address and the IP address of server A do not match, the packet will be discarded. In this case, however, the addresses do match and so the packet can be processed. If the packet is a fragment of a set of packets, it is necessary that these fragments be reassembled firstly, using the identification field to collect the fragments together, the flags field to verify that the last fragment has been received, and the fragment offset to determine the correct fragment order for the reassembly process. Following any reassembly, the packet header must be decapsulated and the data transferred to the next protocol, which based on the protocol field in this example, references a 06 value which relates to TCP. Once the segment is received by the transmission control protocol, the same integrity check is performed. In this instance, we can see that the received TCP segment originated from a source port of 1027 and is destined for port 80, which is the well-known port for HTTP traffic. The acknowledgement bit in the COPIT field is set to 1, indicating that this segment is in fact an acknowledgement to data that has been received from server A that is in fact a web server. Upon receipt of this TCP acknowledgement, the HTTP service will proceed to transmit any additional HTTP traffic to host A as necessary, 
resulting in a new cycle of encapsulation and data transmission occurring. In summary for this section and unit, then we have uh, four questions here. The first asks, what information is required before data can be encapsulated? Well, prior to encapsulation, the source must be aware of a valid path that it can be taken by IP in order to reach the intended destination. In addition, the forwarding address must be resolved to a physical next hop that is often discovered through ARP. What happens when a frame is forwarded to a destination to which it is not intended? Well, the frames that arrive at any destination within a local segment are assessed by comparing the MAC address of the interface upon which they were received to the MAC address in the destination MAC field of the frame header. If the two addresses do not match, with exception to the frame being a broadcast or a multicast MAC address that this particular host is listening for, the frame will be discarded. How does the data in the frame ultimately reach the application it is intended for? Well, the destination port number in the TCP and UDP headers provides the port information necessary to reach the intended service or application and allow any data to reach its intended destination. When multiple sessions of the same application are active, for example in the case of multiple web browsers, how does the return data reach the correct session? Well, each session will assign a separate source port number that allows the different sessions of the same service to be distinguished. If two web browsers were opened by host A, intended for the same HTTP server, each session would show the same destination port of port 80. However, each web session would be represented by a unique port number on the host, such as 1028 and 1030. This enables the server to distinguish between each browser session on the same host.